Guys, we have the distinct joy today of Ayup Shak Essen. And I have a little to tell you about him. Graduated from the University of Kansas with his PhD in higher ed in December of 15. So it looks like maybe he's nine years into that. Uh, you can see involved in the Dialogue Institute of the Movement for the Global Warming of Hearts, which I think is his um, creation. Um, and I think that's a neat, I love the uh, sort of turn to you know, global warming, okay, of hearts. Previously worked as an advisor at Wichita State, um, which I get to be around in my weekday job. Um, works with students in diverse backgrounds, uh, passionate about fostering dialogue across cultures. And then that, of course, is a beautiful thing. Organizes various events to promote peace. His ultimate goal is to contribute to the global warming of hearts, aiming to depolarize the world. Also a fabulous idea. Um, eight years ago, he got the most outstanding international student award from KU. So there you go in 2014. Um, in 2018, published his first book, Global Warming of Hearts, and followed up with, I am not colorblind. So I'll be curious to hear about that, maybe in Coffee Talk, if he cares to offer. And then the last and maybe the coolest, um, he has a brand new baby boy. So today we get to hear uh, the Prophet Muhammad's final sermon, uh, timeless declaration of fundamental human rights, um, a reject, let's see, a rejection of racism, a promotion of social justice, pursuit of equality, and the acknowledgement of women's rights. He encourages us to pay attention or recognize the remarkable foresight that this speech embodies and the deep wisdom that transcends both time and culture. Shaq, please tell us what you have, buddy. Hello, everybody. It is uh, always great to be back. I'm very happy and honored to be with you. Yeah, <clears throat> I was excited when you uh, reached out to me. Um, if whether I can be a speaker this week. I'm like, I'm in Chicago, but now everything is virtual. Uh, and I really uh, find this, actually one of the Prophet Muhammad's qualities is to say yes. And I also understand sometimes with the self-care and time management, they encourage people to say no, but I'm not there yet. I don't know. I still, or sometimes, you know, delegation is definitely is part of the job, but I don't know, especially with this kind of gatherings, I just find joy and really meaning. And we start the day, well, although we wake up early, when I say we, my wife and I, uh, we like to eat late. So we will even actually go to a brunch after this event. So, and that's fine. That's our lifestyle. So I go have coffee with a friend, maybe uh, do my exercise, gym, and then we I come home and prepare the breakfast, brunch, or <laughs> so I'm so happy uh, to be with you. And yeah, today I want to talk about Prophet Muhammad's peace be upon him final sermon. Uh, as a way of respect, we uh, Muslims always say peace be upon him or her when we talk about a prophet or some religious leaders uh figures including mother mary who also has a high reverence for muslims who has a dedicated chapter in the quran and she is the only woman who had a dedicated chapter on her name in the quran so this is a frequent saying when you see pbuhe acronym somewhere that's what it means even years ago when i first moved to the u.s i thought when people said jesus i thought it sounds blasphemous really because you cannot, like, you wouldn't call Jesus as Jesus. We, like, in Turkey, we believe in Jesus in a different way, you know, prophecy, uh, impeccability. But always people say, Jesus, peace be upon him. Moses, peace be upon him. When you say Jesus, people will like, which Jesus are you talking about? Plus, we have millions of Jesus in Turkey. People name their kids Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> or their, you know, kids, Muhammad or Mary. So, um, but yeah, that's what it means. And this final talk, even I think among Muslims, you know, I don't know, maybe it's same in other religious traditions, 
when we read, we don't always read, uh, like we don't try to analyze always what it really means. It is more, okay, this is, you know, part of our religion, part of our culture, let's read it. But what it really tells, I think living in the U.S. is helping me to learn more about Islam, to really analyze, because people just ask any questions, which we don't ask, which we never ask when I lived in Turkey, especially. Really, like for many years, I didn't really think, you know, Prophet Muhammad's peace be upon him final talk it's really about anti-racism, about human rights, women's rights. And we are talking about 14 centuries ago. And we still deal the same issues today, unfortunately, right? We still talk about social justice, inequality, women's rights. On one hand, it should be embarrassing that we are still talking about it. But it is uh, one of my dream vision for the Dialogue Institute Kansas City, a Dialogue Institute without me, a world without dialogue institute, which this dialoguing will be just so organic and natural, and it wouldn't sound newsworthy to say, oh, I can I have friends from different backgrounds. And the new generation of the self, so why is this important? Why do you feel a need to say so? Because it should be just natural and organic. And that's I think um when I read more and more and thought about this final sermon that's what it comes to my mind but also especially you know growing up in turkey um you know we hear about turkish ethnocentrism after moving to the u.s i learned about u.s you know american ethnocentrism but then i realized oh it is embedded in different cultures russians think they are the superior chinese think they are the most superior and this is like across cultures uh, but especially, I mean, I don't think, you know, this is a healthy conversation to compete on who is the most superior, which ethnicity or which religion. Um, then I thought about this final sermon and same for the sports, you know, the debate on who is the God. It's not, you know, fight real big bloody fight, but still, you know, argument. So I'm like, you know, these religions or ethnicities, you know, I didn't choose to be a Turkish. I didn't choose to. I didn't choose my character, I mean, my color or my skin. That's how I was born and where I was born. So especially the quote about anti-racism really stick my heart. And today I'm going to share, you know, first my screen and let's talk a little bit about those, uh, you know, words of prophets, Muhammad, peace be upon him. And just to make sure you are able to see my screen, I believe. Awesome. Let me just. And this is kind of an opening chapter of the Quran. Uh, to be clear, the Quran is the words of God fully, 100%. Prophet Muhammad did not write the Quran. Sometimes people think some words of the Prophet is in is part of the Quran. No, the Quran is part of 100% Prophet Muhammad's, sorry, God's words. And Prophet Muhammad's words are called Hadiths or traditions in English. Um, so in the name of Allah, the gracious, the merciful, praise to be Allah, Lord of the worlds, the most gracious, the most merciful, master of the day of judgment. It is you we worship and upon you we call for help. Guide us to the set straight path, the path of those you have blessed, not of those against whom there is anger, nor of those who are misguided. This is kind of the opening chapter of the Quran, and people usually uh, start their talk with this uh, chapter of the Quran. So I will start with a few quotes from the prophets and then you know, move towards to the final sermon. Paradise lies at the feet of the mother. This is you know, definitely metaphorical, but I hope this is one of the best translations and I hope this makes sense to you. But this shows how mothers are valued in Islam. It is... You know, I mean, I think across cultures, mothers are highly valued. Uh, but also in Islam, it is so crucial to take care of your mom, to respect, to love. I personally like talk to my mom sometimes three times a day. I try avoid saying I am busy because in the world, I think among 8 billion, most people are so busy. 
I am like, I want to be unique. I want to be unbusy. I don't want to sound busy to people, especially when it comes to your loved ones, because there will be a time uh, I will have so much more time, but my mother will not be with me. And this is a reality that everyone faces in their life. But, you know, uh, everyone makes their own choices and their own priorities. So that's, uh, but definitely the saying of the prophet is always in our minds since our childhood. Um, so it is always feels special. Uh, it's like a special treat. Sometimes when we always have those loved ones so reachable, that may kind of lose the flavor, the appreciation of the mothers or, or other loved ones. But anyway, I just want to be aware of that, conscious of that. And why not call, even actually I changed my father's attitude that, you know, when he, she, when he, he told me he was calling his mom, my grandma, uh, every Friday. And he thought that was a great thing that he calls regularly. I'm like, why not every day? Why not? Why just Fridays? And now after that, for the last 10 years, he has started calling every day. Again, why not? So be kind for whenever kindness becomes part of something. It beautifies it whenever it is taken from something. It leaves tarnished. Again, kindness, I think, is a universal language. You don't have to be a Muslim to be kind. This is across religions, across cultures. And again, imagine that you are saying kind words to um, a cashier at, Walmart, cashier at Walmart, and that person will be happy, right? But if you are unkind and rude to her, she will be very upset. That doesn't, he, she doesn't have to be American. She can be just any religion. She doesn't have to be Christian. She doesn't have to be Muslim. She can be just anything or nothing. But those words, you know, affect all of us. Speak a good word or remain silent. I think that's a quality that uh, in the U.S. is very prevalent that instead of kind of making too many negative comments, people choose to be silent. That's what my observation, you can correct me. Uh, every act of kindness is charity. One of the uh, pillars of Islam is uh, charity uh, or almsgiving, which is 2.5% of your accumulated wealth what that means let's say you make you know seventy thousand dollars a year and you paid all of your bills and all of the food and everything and you still have maybe five thousand dollars extra in your bank account from that bank account you are required to give donate or give actually 2.5 percent but let's say if you don't have anything in your bank account then any kind of act, act of kindness is charity so charity is not always materialistic. It's not always money. Sometimes people think it is just money and they don't have enough money to donate. But no, kindness is also charity. Smile is actually charity in Islam. And yeah, do not waste water if you, if you are at a running stream. So like we as Muslims, especially when we make our prayers, we take ablution. But that is a very old English word. I don't know if you still use that, but especially washing some parts of your body. Imagine that you are in a river, which is, you know, a lot of water. But even there, you are encouraged to use it wisely. Uh, but it is also kind of metaphorical that you have to be mindful or eating. You know, when you uh, sometimes, unfortunately, you know, go to buffet restaurants, there might be too much food you put in your plate too much and then some goes to waste. But always being mindful, just get whatever you can eat, but do not waste. Eat, drink, but do not waste is another saying of the prophets. And always, you know, uh, the strong person, uh, kind of anger management is also very crucial in Islam. Here is a quote, another quote, the strong person is not the good wrestler. The strong person is only the one who controls themselves when they are angry. We know that that is not always easy. And I read articles on Mayo Clinic. I felt like that was very inspirational from Prophet Muhammad's sayings. Uh, you know, Pro Mayo Clinic's articles also encourage you to move, to wash parts of your body uh, so that, you know, your anger in a way will be extinguished. And that is an approach by the Prophet also. It is not easy always. And the final sermon 
by Prophet Muhammad, always please yeah, keep in mind that this talk was given 14 centuries ago when they had challenges like us, maybe more challenges, but those challenges are the still similar to ones we are facing today, even in the U.S., uh, you know, in the superpower of the world, even in the U.S., these are still relevant. And this is actually, you know, uh, I think about 100,000 people came together to listen to Prophet Muhammad's peace be upon him talk. Uh, people felt that this is his final sermon. You know, it wasn't obvious, but it was in a way implied that it was his final talk. Um, And yeah, all people lend me an attentive ear for I don't know whether after this year I shall ever be amongst you again. Therefore, listen to what I'm saying to you carefully and take these words to those who could not be present here today. So, 100,000 people were there, but they also kind of took notes and shared it with, shared this with other people. And human dignity, you know, that is universal. Absolutely. Uh, this is especially hurt no one so that no one may hurt you. Remember that you will indeed meet your Lord and that he will indeed record uh reckon your deeds so in islam uh definitely you cannot hurt anyone at all and i was flying to turkey years ago i had an atheist american friend uh, when i say friend just met on the plane sitting next to each other he told me he hates catholics uh and then uh, we started, you know, we had a little bit of religious, you know, conversation about religion. And when he heard that I'm a Muslim, he said, oh, you believe that you have to kill someone to be able to go to paradise, right? I was like, wow. Uh, but I just listened to him patiently because, I mean, he was, you know, misinformed. He had his own prejudice, stereotypes, but if I approach him, you know, with anger, frustration, or just blame him because of his ignorance, it won't be a really lesson for him. It won't be really an educational experience. So, but I was patiently, you know, listening and explained what we believe. A uh, direct quote from the Quran is, if you kill one innocent person, you are likely to kill all the humankind. If you save one innocent person, you are likely to save all humankind. Uh, that is the Islamic approach uh, that you cannot even hurt people's feelings. A common Islamic saying, which we, you know, translation, we can translate. Let's say, you know, I'm with you today. And at the end of my talk, or when we are about to leave, what most Muslims say, oh, please forgive me if I hurt your feelings. Whether intentionally or unintentionally, because let's say I may make a joke, most of you may laugh it, but it may be a trigger effect for you. You may have a trauma about that, which I don't know. Or culturally, when we say culturally, it's not just like US or Turkish or different cultures, even you know, men and women culture, but also just individual differences. You know, it is very difficult, impossible to generalize actually human beings, although we do that, but that is impossible. You may, someone may made fun of you years ago by making that joke, and I am maybe using a similar joke. Again, everyone is laughing, but it is hurting your feelings, and I wouldn't be sure that it is hurtful for you. So that's why people, Muslims always say, please forgive me if I hurt your feelings. Uh, before again it may sound awkward if we say this over and over in the u.s but that is the kind of background of that saying and this is although uh, you know especially this code is more about human beings uh but also actually it says you know one so it in this you know there are a lot of quotes of the prophet uh for example some of them are also about human uh, uh, animal rights uh, when you Say like, I, I don't know, I didn't like live in a farm or I didn't work with animals much. But when you milk an uh, 
animal, make sure that you cut your nails in case you know that might hurt that animal. Or when you call an animal, especially a horse, a direct example, by pretending that you had something in your hand, make sure you really have something. Otherwise, you would be among liars. So even with your interaction with the animals, you cannot be a liar, you cannot be dishonest against those animals. And animals are seen as the silent servants of God. Silent servants of God. So, you know, it's not like, oh, they cannot talk, they don't feel. No, 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 no. You know, God created them for a reason. God created the nature for a reason. Women's rights and treating women well. Uh, it is true that you have certain rights with regard to your woman, but they also have right over you. If they abide by your right, then to them belongs the right to be fed and clothed in kindness, to treat your woman well and be kind to them, that they are your partners and committed helpers. So, you know, these are some quotes. I can actually share the full version of the sermon with you. Actually, even the full version is just like one and a half page. So it's not too, too long. But imagine that uh, 14 centuries ago, woman was even not seen as human beings. It was more seen uh, by property, by many, many people at that time. Uh, in Islam, for example, let's say my wife was a doctor in Turkey uh, and she is switched to IT now. She worked in St. Luke's before, but she switched to IT. And definitely, you know, she's making money. As a woman, she does not have to share her money, salary with me, her income with me. That is her privilege to keep her money. Uh, in case, let's say, uh, a divorce or in case of, I don't know, whatever, she does not have to share her income with me. I have to share, but she doesn't have to share. She shares, but she does not have to. And women, uh, as sometimes, you know, in some cultures, uh, women are seen as, oh, they have to, actually, that was an issue in the U.S. as well, you know, kind of home economics, that women are more like just cook and wash the dishes, wash the clothes, and that's and that. Imagine again, centuries ago, this was a bigger issue. But no, in Islam, even uh, they are encouraged to get their education. They actually, Prophet Muhammad's uh, one of, uh, wife was a businesswoman. Can you imagine? Did you know that? <clears throat> yeah, he his wife was a businesswoman and she was richer than Prophet Muhammad. I think many people might be surprised to hear that, but no, she was the businesswoman. <clears throat> um, and kindness definitely when I talk about sometimes or when I listen about women's rights you know women's rights are human rights it's not just you know we have to be kind women because they are women we are all human beings in Islam we have to respect everyone we have to kind, be kind it's not just out of courtesy it is a must it is a requirement so it is Actually, having a newborn baby who is 73 days old, by the way, is giving me more perspective. So now I do most of the chores at home. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is not like rocket science, but it takes time. Right. You know, washing the dishes, anyone can do it, but it takes time. You know, you know, vacuuming. Oh, my gosh, it takes so much time. Uh, all this cleaning. Now shopping, by the way, for example, we had to, you know, come up with uh, creative ways to still do my Dialogue Institute work. By the way, my full-time job, I work for a college and now having a kid, how do we manage the time? Well, one of our good investments is Instacart. I don't know if anyone uses here Instacart. You can shop from any market, except Walmart, by the way. 40, 47 markets, except Walmart. Uh, so they bring it to your home. We are like, you know, this is, I don't know, one of my best investments. <laughs> Instead of spending like five, six hours at a market, um, you know, just doing that. But this is really a perspective. Oh my gosh, my wife did so much for our home, for our family. Now, 
It just actually, my perspective is our newborn baby is helping me not to violate my wife's rights at home. That she was doing more chores than me. Uh, but again, I'm not seeing, oh, that's something she has to do. No, as a human being, we have to do that together. Again, I don't think, I don't see this as, oh, I'm being so kind or I'm helping her. No, as a partner, that is my responsibility. It is something I have to do. And again, I don't want people to think, oh, he's being so nice. No, this is a must. This is a requirement that we have to work together. Uh, in the final sermon of the prophet, prophet also talk about pillars of Islam and avoid economic equality. Uh, inequality, I, I think, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, not avoiding the equality, avoiding economic inequality. So uh, the pillars of Islam, briefly, prophet reminds here, worshiping Allah, uh, the only God, one God, um, God with uh, uppercase G, capital G, uh, only one God, five time daily prayers. Uh, it is kind of a reminder of our connection with God, offering thanks to God all day long. It is, I, you know, I, I do this, you know, also personally, these prayers, also do some readings from the Quran and also some spiritual readings as well as other readings. I feel like those are my, like allergy medicines to me. I have pollen allergy. I have uh, that I take almost every day. Um, when I don't take it, oh, I have a very miserable day. Now I see these worships, you know, these prayers, these readings are allergy medicines to the worldly pleasures and desires. Because, you know, when we start our day, during the day, we always feel, most people feel they are so busy. A lot of, you know, things to do in the life. But again, if you don't really, if a person don't do these readings or spiritual uh, prayers I will do the same but I will always want to pause and reflect during the day and those prayers are like you know um, kind of wireless connection to God you know most of us I think have smartphones without that smartphone without the internet we feel like disconnected from this life so the lack of the prayers are lack of like iPhone for me that disconnecting from God. So it is always having that uh, 5G connection with the God. Fasting, you know, is kind of an empathy towards less fortunate, but also an awareness of what God has blessed me. You know, I am having coffee here. I am having my water. While fasting, uh, we don't even drink water and coffee during 16 hours, for about 16 hours. Um, one may think, oh, how do you live without that? But, you know, you see, actually, this is also uh, not the purpose of life. You know, the goal of life is not to have coffee every day. It is, I think, beyond that. It is always nice to have coffee. Even actually, it helps you to appreciate more. Imagine that you, I mean, that is my life, actually. I've been eating more, like, um carefully within the last like 26 months almost i have lost about 75 pounds um not for like religious reasons but the overall experience helped me to appreciate whatever i eat and drink more uh and the uh, avoiding economic inequality is about the charity actually it is more uh obligatory so charity is not the exact the right transition because charity is not required. It is, you know, optional. And this is to avoid inequality. Every Muslim who has enough financial means have to share their income or their accumulated wealth with the less fortunate ones in the community. That could be also a donation to a charity organization, but also individual beings uh, throughout the year. There are certain times, but you don't really have to do at those certain times. You can also spread all around the year. And the pilgrimage is the spiritual experience done in Medina 
uh, where actually Malcolm X, if you know, you know, that is the experience that helped him to get rid of his own uh, racial, racist uh, ideas in a way. So I like in relation to that, eliminating racism, please re let's read this together. All mankind or humankind is from Adam and Eve, an Arab has no superiority over a non-Arab, nor a non-Arab has any superiority over an Arab. Also, a white has no superiority over a black, nor a black has any superiority over a white, except by piety and good action. Remember, 14 centuries ago, racism was issue even then. So it didn't start in the US. It was there in different parts of the world. Have you heard of Islamic call to the prayer? Some of you might heard. Islamic call to the prayer is like an invitation to the five-time daily prayers, especially it is recited loudly in Islamic countries. But I heard it in Minnesota, in a town in Minnesota, uh, it, they also started reciting that loudly. Uh, the first person who recited Islamic call to the call to the prayer is a black man. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was aware of the racism back then. And he intentionally chose that black man to recite, to call to the prayer. His name is Bilal Habeshi. Among many other uh, examples, he, uh, one of the other example is, one of the companion of the prophet called another black companion, hey, the son of a black woman. <clears throat> and that was very, uh, maybe not intentional, but derogatory in their culture as well. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> the black man, complain about it to the prophet and the other person felt so bad and so bad and they you know definitely you know apologized and said please put your like feet on my head again metaphorically that's how bad he felt and the you know they kind of hugged each other and apologized but it was there sometimes people do this unintentionally not always intentionally. I was so surprised. A Park University professor uh, was offering a class on ethics of joking. Again, you may think you are being funny, but again, it may be offensive in another culture. So this was um, an issue from centuries ago that is still relevant, unfortunately, but it is, yeah. And this is kind of the final quotes of the prophet's um, final sermon. Prophet Muhammad, people upon him, is uh, reminding people that he is leaving behind two things. One is the Quran, the other is Sunnah. Sunnah is the tra uh, tra traditions of the prophet Muhammad. So Quran is the main source of the knowledge. Uh, for Muslims, for guidance, but also the traditions of the prophet. Sometimes, you know, you ask a religious question and we may quote from the Quran or the sayings of the prophet Muhammad. They are more complimentary, not rivalry, not like, oh, this is better than this, but it is more giving sometimes more explanation to our questions. And yeah, and prophet Muhammad is making sure that the 100,000 people are being witness that he conveyed his message to the people. And always remember that Prophet Muhammad's final talk, um, actually, you know, we don't see Islam as the only, like, only true religion. Islam is more complementary, complementing Juda Judaism and Christianity. Sometimes, you know, you hear about some Islamic teachings and you may say, oh, this is similar in Christianity. This is similar in Judaism. That is not really something surprising for us. Yes, it's we believe the source is the same. Um, it is more surprising that we are being surprised. <laughs> so we believe the source is same. So again, thank you so much. I am stopping here. Thank you.
Let's just take a moment now to meditate on Shaq's words. So if you feel comfortable again, whatever works for you, maybe close your eyes or just take a deep breath and let some of those ideas sink in. The five pillars of Islam, whether you subscribe to Islam as a faith tradition or not, faith ideas transcend We all worship in our own ways and start with prioritizing the big picture of being appreciative and thankful for what is, for God, however you perceive in your tradition, in what you hold. How do you see that? And within that, five times a day, pray. How do I do that? Do I do that? Do I want to do that? Is it worth the time to take a moment to try and align with something bigger than myself. Just even bringing to consciousness the idea of taking a moment five times a day to reprioritize. Maybe taking a, a time, specify any time to stop doing whatever you do fast to fast, to sh shake things up a little bit, stop doing whatever it is you're doing, consciously fast. A break from what appears to be to what you know is fasting from the day-to-day Centering in what is the truth for you. And from that truth, kindness, giving, however that appears, how do you see charity? However you see it, bless yourself by remembering to be it, to do it, to see it, charity. And in Islam, there's a, a requirement to go to a place in pilgrimage, a big priority, at least once in your life, to make that journey. How do we do that? Do we do it? Do we choose to do it? Do we prioritize something bigger than our day-to-day -day life to which we dedicate our lives? Living from principle, what a blessing Shaq has been to remind us of these ancient enduring ideas. Now, allowing ourselves to come back to this moment and be thankful for what is and for Shaq's presentation. Amen. Thank you, Shaq, and Dennis, thank you for your meditation, buddy.